Amen. Well, is everybody doing good today? Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. You ready to hear something from the Word? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're in this series of messages that we've been talking about called In Building the Hearth, Stewarding God's Intimacy. How many want to be more intimate with God? Yeah. Amen. That should be the cry of all of our hearts. Lord, help us to get to know you as well as you get to know us. Amen? Who do you think knows you better, God or yourself? That's right. He's intimately acquainted with all of our ways. And so as we have heard from Pastor Sean and Aaron and Dr. John concerning the hearth, we know that we are building something in our midst. Amen? Something that will prevent fire hazards, Give us a warm place to sit at the Father's feet, and a number of other things. But in this message, I want to talk about, I know there's a lot of different stones that go around into making that hearth, but I want to talk about four very important stones that are involved in making the hearth a place of intimacy. And so without these stones... I don't think we can experience God's intimacy in our lives. We won't experience the presence that he desires in our lives. How many want the presence of God? Amen. That again, that's something that we all long for, is just to bask in his presence and enjoy what he's doing in our lives. And so without these stones... Without, the, without these stones, we will not experience all that God wants to do in our lives. And I, I believe that every one of us, I don't care who you are, where you've come from, how many sins you've committed, <laughs> you're valuable in his presence. And he wants to do something with your life. He wants to produce something in your life. He wants you to become one of his flames of fire that come out of that hearth, a hearth. <laughs> I guess last week we, or a week ago we found out the correct pronunciation. <laughs> and so we, we all want that in our lives. And so our desire is to have a hearth that will produce flames of fire, that will burn brightly, and that will catapult us into whatever it is that God has given us to do. Because we all have a ministry. I don't care who you are, how old you are in the Lord, you have a ministry. You have a calling. You're a part of his purpose on the earth today. You're one of his fingers. <laughs> You're one of his toes. You're a part of him. You are a part of the body of Christ. And we together... God wants to produce something in us that is powerful, something the world has never experienced. Well, they've experienced tastes of it, parts of it, but they've never experienced the complete, outside of Jesus Christ, who had the full measure of the Spirit. The world has not experienced the full measure of His Spirit coming forth out of His body. And it's when we are transformed into flames of fire, just like the disciples were, that will happen. In Hebrews 1 and verse 7, this is um, taken from Psalms 104, where it says, regarding the angels, he says, he sends his angels like winds, his servants like flames of fire. And that's how God wants to send you. He wants to send you like a flame of fire. But in order to do that, <laughs> you have to have that hearth in which to evolve from. Amen? Dr. John showed us this amazing picture a few weeks ago when the disciples experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we don't talk about that a whole lot, but we should. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is an integral part of who God has created us to be. I don't think we can fulfill the ministry that God has given to us apart from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
But when the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I'm not going to teach on that today, but I'm going to make reference to it. It takes a whole sermon in itself just to teach on it. But when it came to the disciples, it came with tongues of fire. Tongues of fire. Fire, that it is, in, a, in a sense, it's, um, it, it's, it indicates the passion, the fervency that we have for the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to impart that passion, that fervency in all of our lives. And so that we are consumed by it. When they received that fire, that fire that came, they were baptized in fire. When they received that, it literally transformed their lives from being these weak and anemic disciples and disciples who were now bold, going forth in the presence of God, healing people, Peter and John walking up to the temple, silver and gold have I none, but be healed in the name of Jesus. And immediately the man stands up. And on other occasions, here's Peter and the disciples walking through the crowds and his shadow alone, people would get healed just by his shadow. And it says people were coming from all over, just like they came from all over to hear Jesus. They were coming from all over the, the areas of Judea and Samaria to hear what was going on with the disciples. And their shadow alone would heal people. It says all who came, you know, it says the same thing about Jesus. All who came to Jesus were healed. Jesus didn't turn anybody away because it was a part of the covenant that he came to fulfill. And now here's the disciples full of the fire of God, full of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And everybody who came was being healed. And that's the intensity that God wants to impart into our lives as well. It's the same thing that he desires for everybody sitting here today. That's an awesome concept to get a hold of. But first you have to be consecrated to his purpose. That has to be the thing that you live and breathe. That you are a son of God, a daughter of God that is consecrated to his purpose. It says, Lord, I want the fire of God to fall upon me. Yes. Amen? Yes. And so, therefore, we need the hearth that will contain the fire of God in our lives. If we don't have a hearth, you know what happens? That fire turns into wildfire. And wildfire causes a lot of harm. And so we need that hearth to contain the flames of God and their intended purpose. The four stones needed to build the right kind of hearth will not allow our flames to go out. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have that flame burning in you. And part of its purpose is to burn the chaff out of your life. Right. Is to burn the old to burn the sin out of your life so that you can be so filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that it's hard for him to hold you back. It says in 1 John 4, 19, we are to love him because he first loved us. Amen? I think it says in Romans 9, while we were still in our sins, he died for us. Sometimes we sing that song. Let me let you in on a little clue. You did not find Jesus. <laughs> he found you. Amen. He searched you out and, and drew you unto himself. It was God doing that. Amen. Drawing you to the heart of Jesus. To put his spirit in you. And so we discover in the great commandment what these four foundational stones are. They disclose how we are to love God and how he reveals to us and develops in us the warmth and the intimacy and the security that is needed to go forth as his flames of fire. 
We find this in Luke 10, verse 27, where Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That doesn't leave much out, does it? I think it covers the whole gambit of our lives. <laughs> it covers our intellect. It covers our emotions. It covers our will. <laughs> it covers our strength that we have in our bodies. And he says we're to love the Lord in all of these areas. And so the four foundational stones, stones are given in these scriptures as to how we are to build the hearth. And to show us how we are to love God. How many want to know better how to love God? I think we all do. And then it goes, so, so what we're talking about here is loving the God, loving God with all, next slide please, with all of our heart, which is the emotional nature. How many know that we have an emotional nature? Sometimes, and, and here's the thing, as I go through this, some of the things you're going to say, well, I'm really strong in this area. But I'm pretty weak in that area. When it comes to the emotional area, I'm not very strong. Sometimes I don't even know how I feel. I have to think about it. Sometimes if I want to be sad, I have to really think about something that's really sad. And I'll begin to feel that emotion of sadness. And so for some of us, loving God with all of our heart, I'm out there. <laughs> that's easy. But for some of us, it's not so easy. And then with all of our soul, and, and I would venture to say that this is the one most of us have the trouble with, our willing nature. You know, when John was told to eat the book, in the book of Revelation, it was sweet as honey. And then as he digested it, it became bitter. And I, this is what happens sometimes. When the revelation of God enters our spirit, it's sweet. It tastes good. But then when it comes in contact with our soul, actually the soul encompasses all of this, but especially the part of our will. When it encompasses our will, all of a sudden, that sweet thing we tasted is no longer sweet. <laughs> it's bitter. It's like a bitter pill to swallow. But we have to swallow it, amen? amen. <laughs> Otherwise, we're not loving God with our will. And so we have to love him with our will if we want to be fully consecrated unto him. And with our mind, that's our intellectual nature, loving his word. That, that's where I'm strong. Right from the outset, when I was a baby Christian, the word, I, I, you couldn't pull me away from it. I was, I was just encapsulated by it. I devoured it day after day. I would sit for hours sometimes just reading the word. You know why? Because I was a burned out hippie. <laughs> With my mind so messed up. I had done so many drugs and all of that that I was a mess. I had lost touch with reality. Didn't even understand what reality was anymore. And I began to digest his word. And you know what began to happen? A new reality began to form in my life. And now that's the reality that I walk in. That reality that I first received when I began to devour his word. And so... We'll, we'll talk about each one of these as we go through. I'm just introducing them right now. And then with all of our strength, our physical nature. And sometimes that's kind of hard because we have so many things in this world that zap our strength. You know, just living alone. I mean, living, just in living <laughs> can zap your strength. And you have very little left over to give to God. And so we need to understand how do we relate to that? How do we channel that? 
How do we channel our energy? How do we channel our strength so that we have enough left over to serve the purposes of God? And so the total person is to love God, mind, will, emotion, and strength. For example, let's say you love God with the strength of mind, but your weakness and your emotions. You will become, if that's the case, if you don't deal with your emotions, you will become a legalist. You will become a legalist in your approach to God, not only in your approach to God, but your approach, your approach to others. Because how we view God has a way of transforming it into how we relate to the people around us. What if you love him with a strength of emotion and weakness of mind? That's what I just talked about. With the strength of mind and weakness of emotion, you become an intellectualist and a legalist in your approach to God. With the strength of emotion and weakness of mind, what happens there, you become a sentimentalist, sentimentalist in your actions, in your religion. You'll be governed by your feelings, which will be expressed in an inordinate amount of affection. And so you say, well, I'm an emotional being. <laughs> I love everybody. <laughs> you know, that's good. But it has to be balanced out with the other areas for you to be complete and whole. Frankly, I wish I was a little bit more emotional at times. I had the, and I'll share with you a little bit how I get to that part of my life how I get in touch with my emotions. And then, what if, what if you're strong in your will and weak in your emotions? You become like an iron man, unapproachable. <laughs> Very hard for people to approach you. And so when we love God with all of our strength of emotion, will, physical strength, and strength of mind, we will be Christians who have a balanced strength of character, who are truly loving God as he has commanded us to do. And so therefore, let's look at each one of these. The hearthstone number one, loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, the emotional nature. And as I said, for some of us, it comes easy. For some of us, it's pretty difficult. And so we have to learn how to get in touch with our feelings. How is it that we love God emotionally? For me, it's through worship and praise. I'm not even a singer. I can't even carry a tune. But you know, when I sing in tongues, I don't have to worry about how it's coming out. <laughs> I'm just singing unto the Lord, amen? And I get touched. And here's the thing, those of you who speak in tongues, if you're just speaking it, in a mindless, chattering way, it's not doing you any good. You have to get your heart engaged. When you get your heart engaged, you experience the flow of the Holy Spirit working through you. It builds your faith. It causes you to rise up and be filled with his revelation and however he wants to deal with you. And so I find myself, I remember... Again, when I was a young Christian, I was going to Bible college, and I had a part-time job working at Sears in their warehouse, putting bicycles together, and, and uh, I was a bicycle repairman. And, and, li and living up in Anchorage, you wouldn't think that would be a need, but when spring hit, we, we couldn't put bicycles together fast enough. And anyway, in that job, we had a break room. And in that break room, we would all congregate, you know, three times during the shift. During our morning break, our lunch, and our afternoon break. And we had a ping pong table there and a pool table. And, and this happened, it must have been a Monday. Because every, everybody was sitting around, you know, just sitting around enjoying everything. And all of a sudden, the conversation turned to what, how wicked they were the, on the weekend. You know... How much booze they drank, how many fights they got into, all that kind of stuff. And, and I'm sitting there thinking, and all of a sudden, 
I was just overwhelmed with a sense of thankfulness. Thank you, God, that you delivered me from that. Thank you, Lord, that you sought me out and brought me into a place where I can stand on solid ground and know who I am and where I'm going. And to this day, that scene still resonates in my heart and my mind every time I think about it. I think about God's goodness. And emotion starts to well up in me. Praise starts, you know, I'm, some of you may not do it, but I know this, but I'm a DoorDash driver. <laughs> I, that's what I do, um, just to keep things going and stay healthy, you know. 74 years old, I gotta be out doing something, otherwise I'm just laying around. But um, what I do is I pray a lot. I worship a lot. I know what my favorite worship songs are. I go back to the vineyard phase in the 90s and all that. That's my favorite time of worship. And, and some of the early Maranatha stuff. In fact, the other day my wife and I were thinking, she, was, she said, well, what were some of those songs we used to sing when we first got saved? And we couldn't f figure out where, you know, where, where, where was the source of that? And then we started listening to some of the old Maranatha songs, and there they were. <laughs> but that gets my heart softened before the Lord. And another thing that softens my heart is poetry. I, I, I do devotions every day, almost, you know, very seldom miss. On this particular morning, I've just finished my devotions and I'm kind of staring. Our, our front window faces east and so you can see the sunset, sunrise. And I'm sitting there looking at the sunrise and, and I'm watching the squirrels play on the roof and in the trees and everything. And, and I stand back and, and the Lord says to me, why don't you write a poem about that? A poem? I've never written anything like that. How do you do that? And so... I got out my pen and paper, and I just started to write. And lo and behold, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me and almost wrote the whole thing for me. It was amazing. And since that time, I've written well over 100 devotional poems. I'm going to read you the one I wrote on that day, just part of it. It's from my new book, Treasures of the Heart. It's got 45 of those poems in it. Looking out my window, that's what it's called. Looking out my window, I see God's wonders in the skies. With expectations of a new day, sunrise is seen as it rises. What will this day bring that wraps me in the arms of his love? As the sun rises, eyes are blinded by its brightness above. Gazing upon its beauty, new revelation awakens with his love. Looking out my window, I feel the sun's warmth so bright. Squirrels play joyfully without thought or care or fright. In the beauty of his created ones, God's hand is seen. As squirrels and sparrows play and fly freely, his care is seen. More than those who chirp and play, in us he delights. Looking out my window, all seen, I'm filled with amazement. Seeing his handiwork, I rejoice in what's made for enjoyment. Looking with care over what's conceived, peace liberates. As faith arises, his love washes with all that's achieved. Wrapped in the tender love of care, the moment is enjoyed. And so that's, that's one of the ways I get in touch with my emotions. And the Lord has shown me, you know, through praise and worship and just being thankful that it means to worship God. It means to adore Him. To worship or honor as deity or as a divine to, or divine. To regard with reverent admi admi admiration and devotion to be extremely fond of. How many are extremely fond of Jesus? Fond. 
Let's look. And stood at his feet behind, his, behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Verse 38 shows real remorse and godly sorrow for her sins. Second Corinthians tells us that when we have a godly sorrow in us, it causes a fervency to take hold in our lives. And so, sometimes, you know, if you're not feeling that fervency in your life, you need to question yourself. What's holding me back? What's holding me back? What do I need to repent of? I got good news, good news for you. You're going to be repenting until the day of Jesus Christ. Because we're, we're being changed and conformed into his image from glory to glory. You know what that means? You have sin that needs to be dealt with <laughs> at every stage of your life. And so, the Bible says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and make him out to be a liar. But on the other side, he says, if you sin, <laughs> you have an advocate with the Father. You know the trick to sinning is? Getting up as quick as you can. The Bible says in Proverbs that the righteous man falls seven times and gets back up. Why does he use the number seven? Completion and perfection. He is perfected forever. Those who are being sanctified. That means you're perfect while you're being sanctified. And that's a key. Because when you understand and get the revelation of that, you run boldly into the Father's arms and receive mercy and help in time of need. Amen? And there's no condemnation. Condemnation is for those who just flagrantly move on and sin and never repent. Romans 8 and verse 1 says, If we walk in the Spirit, there is no condemnation. But if we walk in the flesh, guess what? It's still there. I really believe this. In fact, this was the sermon I was going to preach. Um, and then when Aaron started talking about emotions last week, I, I remembered this. <laughs> I said, that's where I'm going. But um, anyway, when we get a hold of the revelation that we are perfect no matter what, and we're walking in the Spirit, it, break, it just starts breaking bondages in your life. It does. Some of you are not getting free because you don't have the anointing working in you. The anointing is part of every facet of what God is doing in our lives. And that's part of breaking the power of sin in our lives. So as we spend time in personal worship to him, the hardness of our hearts begins to melt away. Psalms 92 Verse 1 through 4. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night on an instrument. Well, I can't do that. I actually, I actually in grade school played the trumpet. But I, I, could, I could learn to play it, but I couldn't play it with other people because I, I never mastered how to keep the beat. <laughs> I still don't know how to keep the beat. <laughs> But when I'm by myself, I'm great. <laughs> With harmonious sound, for you, well, I don't know if my sound all harmonious, but it sound, it's a joyful sound, amen? <laughs> for you, Lord, have made me glad, see? You, Lord, have made me glad in the midst of your praise, in the midst of your worship. And so I encourage you to have personal times of worship before the Lord, just as you have personal times of reading the word before him. Amen? And the following scriptures illustrate this intimacy. In Isaiah 40 and verse 11, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. 
and gently lead those who are with young. In John 12, 13, at the Last Supper, Jesus says, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's John talking. <laughs> I'm talking about me right now. <laughs> you know, here's, here's the thing, though. The reason John could say that is because he had a revelation of the love of Christ. He knew he was special. And I got news for you. We are all special. We're all his favorites. We just need to get a revelation of that. That needs to be firm in our understanding. And, and as we begin to really focus on how special and unique we are, think about who, who you are, what your calling is, what your gifts are, what your innate gifts are, all of that. Think about that. How God created you to be the person that you are. And that when you come in sync with all that he's commissioned for your lives, your lives just begin to flow in a harmonious way. And so when you think about how he created you so uniquely, it should cause you to, to just worship and praise and honor him and thank him for what he has done for you. But so many of us get caught up in the negative things of our life. And we can't see that. We have to focus on what he's doing in our lives and how he has redeemed us and made us special. Amen? You are special in God's eyes. You have the same calling in that sense that John did. And then loving him with our willing nature. That's a hard one. Loving the Lord with all of our soul represents our willingness to obey him no matter what it is we're going through. We can obey him during the easy seasons. But how many know life throws curves at you? I mean, think about Charlie and Cindy right now. That's a major curve in their life. I mean a major curve. Charlie cried out on Facebook the other day, I just got in a fight with God. And, and that's okay. Sometimes that's what it takes. David poured out his complaint before God on many occasions because life wasn't going good for him. He was getting a few curves thrown his direction and he didn't like it. And I don't like it when I get a curve thrown my way. But yet, what we have to do amid all of that is say, okay, Lord, I accept the curve. I accept the hardship. Paul wrote to Timothy, as a good soldier, you need to endure hardships. And he's writing the same thing to every one of us because we will have hardships. Jesus says you will have tribulation. So in, amid all of that, you have to submit. This is where you have to say, yes, Lord. You know, we've we, uh, been watching The Passion. We just watched four, five, and six part of it uh, the other day. And it's really getting to the point where they're showing Jesus. He's beginning to feel what's going to happen. And it's <laughs> affecting him in certain ways. And, you know, and, and so you can see where he's having to deal with himself to submit to the cross. And sometimes when you submit to the cross, and Jesus says we all must pick up the cross and carry it. When we submit to that cross, it's not a pretty thing sometimes. It hurts. And we begin to cry. And we don't like the pain and the anxiety that goes with it. But the more we embrace it, he's there to help us carry it. Amen? And so most of us need a little help. The Holy Spirit is our helper. Ask him to help you. So David on many occasions, cried out to God. In Psalms 42, he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? And so David is going through that process. He's talking to his soul. He says, Hope in God. I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. You know, Francis used to teach the sermon on, he taught it many times, on training your soul. And that's really what we have to do, is training 
train our souls to yield to God no matter what the circumstance may be. Because if we don't, we'll find ourselves going backwards and getting full of bitterness. And we don't want that. Jesus talked about this area of loving him on many occasions. He said in John 14, If you love me, keep my commandments. And that was the main commandment. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your soul. And he says, when you do that, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. Aren't you thankful for that? That he may abide with you forever. And then number three, loving the Lord with all of our mind. This is where we get into the word. We must have a love for God's word because it's through his word that our minds or intellect is renewed. Psalms 119, 16 says, I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Psalms 119, 140. Your word. Psalms 119 is all about the word. You know that, don't you? It's the longest chapter in the Bible. And he gives it all <laughs> to his word. Your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. Now here's the thing. Picking up the Bible, this is a heavy one, but it's a good Bible. Um, but picking up the Bible sometimes can seem dreary. <laughs> Where do I start? How do I do this? Well, first of all, you, you, it, it really helps to have a devotional plan. I still, have, I still read through the Bible every year. And the one I read is, um, it has an Old Testament passage, has Psalms or Proverbs, has a New Testament. And so you get a little taste of everything. And, and out of all that, something's going to hit you. <laughs> and, and so here's the thing. If you want to really experience life in the Word, you have to fellowship with it. You have to fellowship with the Word. And you know how that fellowship starts? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, enlighten your word to me as I walk through this today. As I open the passages up. Speak to my heart. And then how many have ever had a scripture just pop out at you? It happens to all of us. You know what you should do when that happens? First of all, you need to get a good Bible. A chain reference Bible. Preferably a Thompson chain reference. They're one of the best ones you can get. Where it has all, on the side has little numbers. And when you're reading that scripture, it'll take, go to the back of the book and show you all the scriptures that go with it. Or it'll just lead you to the next one. That's why it's called a chain reference Bible. And, and so when the Lord starts <laughs> breathing on that and showing you something, search it out, Amen. <laughs> Search it out and see what he's trying to say to you. And then have a journal. Write down some of your thoughts. And, and as you do that, um, you will see that as days and prog progress, that God is speaking something into your heart. And then you get the, a deeper respect and a love for his word. But you have to start somewhere. You have to pick it up off that dusty shelf. And you have to take it and you have to actually open it up. <laughs> and, then, and then you have to start reading. And it may seem so dry. Uh, if you're just starting out, don't start out in Leviticus. <laughs> Get in the New Testament. Get to know the disciples. Get to know Jesus. Amen? Amen. Or go back to the Psalms and the Proverbs, you know, and light reading. <laughs> I mean, I love the Old Testament, but even with me, it gets kind of boring sometimes. <laughs> I love the way, past, I mean, Dr. John brought out all that about Leviticus. That was, that was amazing. <laughs> and so learn how to do Bible study. Be like Mary who would sit at the feet of Jesus. Martha, it says, was distracted with much serving as she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve her? Oh, by the way, in The Chosen, they deal with that so beautifully, that passage. 
Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell... <laughs> Can you imagine he's giving the Lord orders? <laughs> She's pretty bold. Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. And so Mary sought the deeper life with Christ. Her devotion and love for Christ caused her to want to sit at his feet and hear his word. Her heart was consumed with the desire to fill her mind with his word. What we see here is a picture of Mary loving Jesus from a heartfelt warmth and desire and love for her, his word as well. Then finally, the last stone, loving the Lord with all of our strength. God also wants us to love him with our bodies. Loving him with our bodies means we dedicate the strength of our bodies and our energy to him, to his causes and purposes. Romans 12.1 I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your what service? Reasonable service. And so we should ask ourselves, what are we giving the strength of our bodies and our energy to outside of, our, of what our work demands us, what life demands of us? Are we giving Christ first place with our energy and our strength with all of our bodies? You know, my wife, under Francis, she was a benevolence pastor. And, she, and I, back in those days, I had a pickup. And she would always be calling on me. <laughs> this person needs help. They need, to, they need to go get all their stuff moved. And I would say, come on. <laughs> do I really have to do that? But I would do it. I would say, soul, submit. And just do it. And you know, oftentimes the Lord would just bless, you know, for being obedient and doing that. And so those are the kind of things that, you know, that just come up from time to time. I know our lives are so busy nowadays, we can barely find time to go to church sometimes or to the events that we're having because we have so much going on in our lives. But I think we need to look at our lives and say, what can be cut so that I can better serve God with my strength and my passion and all of that. Amen? And so, winding this up, to genuinely, genuinely pursue love, God involves loving him in all of these areas, the mind, the emotion, the will, and our strength. This should be something we pursue with all of our hearts. If we are to be complete and well-balanced Christians, we must pursue God completely with our mind, will, emotions, and strength. And I'll read that scripture once again. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. If you can do that, you have built a hearth that will launch the flames of God into his purpose. Amen? So God bless you. <laughs>